one of the things that makes Max so special is that not only is he passionate enough to take on and learn about that, but he knows how to communicate it, which is something not a lot of people can, but it was, it was fascinating. He's impassioned and I, and I like some of the slightly controversial ideas he brings up. Max Allen's speech was interesting, yeah, particularly talking about, I guess, the, the different take on terroir. His, uh, his, I hadn't heard that before, so it was interesting to hear. First of all, I would like to acknowledge the Bunurong people, who are the traditional custodians of the land that we're on. Uh, and I'd like to pay respect to elders past and present. And we are going back in the past now. We're going back 150 years. Uh, and we're going to Wurundjeri country, the Yarra Valley, home to the Wurundjeri people for tens of thousands of years. And 150 years ago, a aristocratic Swiss settler, the Baron Guillaume de Puri, bought some land on Wurundjeri country, called it Eringberg, and planted a vineyard. He wasn't the only one. There were quite a few... Swiss settlers who were planting vineyards at that time in the Ara Valley. Uh, the Baron's brother, Samuel de Puri, also planted a vineyard uh, at what we now know as Lilydale. He called it Guring Yearing. The same year, 1863, the government here uh, established a station for Aborigines at Corrandirk, which is in what we now know as Healesville. And many of the Kulin Nation uh, the people who lived around Port Phillip were moved to Corrandirk. One of those people was a man called Barak. And you might have heard of Barak. He was a very famous uh, Wurundjeri elder, uh, Norangata, a headman of the Wurundjeri. And he was famous for fighting for his people's rights um, at a time when they were facing uh, many obstacles and lots of opposition. He was also famous as an artist later in life, did many, many pictures of Wurundjeri ceremony. Uh, Barak was born before white people arrived in the Melbourne region uh, and was initiated into Wurundjeri rites and rituals and culture. Very few people know, however, that Barak also became great friends with the Dapuri family who had these vineyards in the Yarra Valley. Uh, there should be a picture behind me appearing at any moment. Oh, do I press it? You told me you'd do it. <laughs> there we go. Uh, this is a picture that Barak painted late in his life uh, as a memento of friendship to Samuel de Puri. So this is the Guring Yearing Vineyard, just outside Lilydale. Um, the Baron de Puri's youngest son, Victor de Puri, also painted a portrait of Barak. So they were communicating and they were expressing friendship through images and, and pictures. Barak spent a lot of time at Yearingburg. There's some fantastic pictures of him there uh, talking, taking tea, eating, drinking, smoking uh, with the Dapuri family. Um, I recently went out to Yearingburg and spoke to the Baron's grandson, Gil Dapuri, who's 80 this year and the third generation um, vigneron at Yearingburg. And uh, Gil told me lots of stories. He um, showed me lots of old notebooks and pictures. And he told me that Barak took his father, George de Puri, the second owner, out in the bush and taught him bush bushcraft and Wurundjeri uh, knowledge. George de Puri in 1886, Gil's father, was sent to Switzerland, like most noble Swiss settlers were, uh, to study and join the cavalry when he was 16. And his mother, wrote him many letters telling him stories of Yeringberg to um, help him uh, get over his uh, homesickness. He talked, uh, she talked in these letters about Barak visiting and, and talking with her about George and his progress. George transcribed all these letters into exercise books and Gil showed me these exercise books the other day. And he showed me a story um, that when George's mother told Barak that George was doing well in the cavalry as a, as a young cavalry officer, Barak said to her, yes, he's a good boy. He sees like a black fella. Ten years ago, I was sitting in an audience just like you, listening to Jeff Grosset. You know, you know Jeff Grosset, the famous Riesling maker from South Australia. And Jeff was talking like we have been today about terroir and uniqueness in Australian wine. And Jeff came up with uh, what I found a remarkable concept. 
he said, there's a word in Ghana language, and the Ghana people are the people uh, like the Wurundjeri here and the Bunurong here, the Ghana people uh, were the traditional co are the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region. And Jeff said, there's a word in Ghana, it's Pankara, and it means a defined territory, a unique place that is passed down from father to son and is connected to the people who live there through language. And I thought, well, <laughs> what an amazing, and this was Jeff's uh, idea, what an amazing definition of terroir that is unique to Australia, but not only unique to Australia, unique to the diverse countries that are Australia. If you're familiar with um, the concept that in Australia, for thousands of years, there were distinct language groups and tribes and clans that lived in very well-defined areas around Australia. We are on Bunurong country, the Yarra Valley is in Wurundjeri country. And then you think that each of those Groups of people have different words for place and terroir and belonging. Then perhaps that's an amazing way of understanding where we are, who we are, and what we're doing here. And I thought that I just think that was I thought it was incredible. And I sat back and waited for the Australian wine industry to engage with this idea. Ten years later, this year. Somebody finally has. Uh, Rob Mann, who is the winemaker at Cape Mantell in Western Australia, uh, wrote something earlier this year where he was exploring his local region, the Noongar people in southwestern uh, Australia, and the people, the saltwater people who lived in the Margaret River of, of uh, the region that we know today were called the Wadandi people, and they had a word for land, which was Buja. So Rob Mann's insight was that perhaps for him, rather than using terroir, a French word, he should use the word Wadandi Buja. Finally, somebody else is engaged with this idea on the other side of the country. But it's not just about language. It's very much about language, but it's not just about language. It's about a way of seeing the world and being in it. So I think now, for example, when I'm, and this may sound trite, but I find it quite a rewarding way to think of things. If I drink a Mornington Peninsula Chardonnay, for example, and I'm eating snapper that was caught in the bay, I am having a Bunurong experience because both the wine and the food come from Bunurong country. Now, you're probably, and I hopefully are, bristling at this idea because it's so problematic. There are so many ways that you could take this and run with it on a very, very superficial level. And when I said that nobody engaged with this idea, as far as I knew, within the Australian wine community for 10 years after Jeff Grosset had this idea, I was wrong. Actually, one company, a South Australian winery, uh, trademarked the word Pankara for a wine label the year after Jeff Grosset's speech. Another company, a pasta maker, has trademarked the word Pankara to sell pasta. I think that's missing the point somewhat. Also, I was Googling this the other day, just Googling Pankara to see what came up, and what came up was a Dutch wine company, a, uh, a wine importer in, in the Netherlands, who is called Pankara Wines. And they explained this uh, with the Pankara story that Jeff Gross had told, and they show uh, a, a, an obligatory picture of, uh, of an Aboriginal man from Arnhem Land, because they're in Arnhem in the Netherlands, uh, in costume, in, in ritual costume, ceremony costume, uh, and they're saying that Pankra is an Aboriginal word for terroir. Now, this is completely missing the point. Using a word from a South Australian Aboriginal uh, heritage to, to, connected to a, a picture from Arnhem Land is about as useful as using, oh, I don't know, a French word like terroir in an Australian context. Worse, the problem with this whole thing is uh, Australia's shameful, brutal and horrific history of grog and the Aboriginal people of this country. I'm fully aware of that. I'm fully aware of the misery. You don't have to think or read very deeply about this to understand what a horrific story it has been. But perhaps engaging with this is a way of bringing some positive balance to that very negative story. And in fact, when I spoke to um, Rob Mann about this, 
he was pretty, uh, pretty clear. He said, look, you know, all he learned about when he was growing up was that we came and we did bad things. So no wonder we have a problem with reconciling when these are the only stories we've been told. I would argue that perhaps learning to see like a black fella is one way of not only understanding your country and what you're doing as wine people and, and appreciating what wine is, the story that wine is in your place, but also a way of perhaps approaching reconciliation. Now, again, that sounds, you know, is that a big leap? Is that too big a leap? Well, I spoke, I've spoken about this at length with um, this artist's great, great niece, Joy Murphy, who is a Wurundjeri elder who lives in Healesville, not far from Corandirk, it's where Corandirk Station used to be. And Joy tells me a story about Corandirk. About the same time, that the De Puri family's vineyards were just beginning to flourish in the 1870s and 80s and winning awards around the world for magnificent examples of Australian wine. Corin Dirk, uh, and the Corin Dirk people had tried many different crops and the one that worked in Corin Dirk was hops. Corin Dirk hops won awards. Their hops were highly regarded and it was something that, that became a seemingly viable and sustainable uh, endeavour and industry and source of income for the Corandirk people. Joy sees it like this. It was something that made history, she says. And of course, the land, the terroir, provided for this plant that had come from another country and nurtured it. So it was obviously the right place. And of course, if you know the Yarra Valley today, there are any number of wineries that are doing well. So there's something in the soil in the Yarra Valley that says, this land is here for everyone and equally provides for all who live on it, so long as the land is cared for and nurtured and treated with respect. When I talked to her about the, the language, the, the word terroir, she completely understood what I meant. She said terroir to her means belonging to country where the growth comes from. Language, says Joy Murphy, is the belonging of your culture. It's about who you are. It's the voice of who you are. And when I speak language, it's who I am. About uh, almost 20 years ago, um, a winery out in the Arrow Valley launched a label called Barak's Bridge in honour of Barak, who was a, this amazing figure. When they did this, they approached Joy, being one of his descendants, uh, and asked whether she minded if that they, they could use this name on their label. And she said, it was a nice connection. Apart from the simple courtesy of asking, being able to acknowledge the original landowners and the history on a wine label was quite special to me. She said, it was as important as if it was my own project. When I saw that Barak label, it gave me an, a great, enormous pride of belonging. And that, I think, is probably the best definition of Australian terroir that I can think of, a pride in belonging. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.